Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Audrey Stewart, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to welcome you to tonight's event with Kate Doty discussing her new book, Mergers and Acquisitions, or Everything I Know About Love I Learned on the Wedding Pages. She's joined tonight in conversation by Jennifer Eight Lee. Through good times and bad, Harvard Bookstore will continue to bring authors and their work to our virtual community. Our spring season is in full swing and we have an amazing summer planned for you. So make sure to check out our event schedule at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk tonight, go to the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In addition, if you would like closed captions, click the button on your screen. If you would like to purchase a copy of Mergers and Acquisitions, there will be a link in the chat where you can purchase. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you. There will also be a link for donation in the chat if you would like to give additional support to Harvard Bookstore. Without your continued support and patronage, this virtual author series wouldn't be possible. Thank you so much for tuning in, in support of our authors and our incredible booksellers and our landmark independent bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support, especially now. And as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings this past year and change, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as we can. Thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. Now I am so pleased to introduce tonight's authors. Kate Doty is a writer and former editor at the New York Times, where she worked for nearly 15 years, including as a wedding announcement writer presidential campaign reporter and senior staff editor on the Food Desk. She currently teaches journalism at the University of North Carolina in Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is joined tonight by Jennifer A. Lee. Jenny is the CEO of Plimpton, a literary studio that works on innovative publishing projects. A former New York Times reporter, Jenny produces, produced The Search for General Zo and The Emoji Story. She was an, the associate producer for Give Me Liberty and one of my favorites, Chasing Coral. Tonight, they are discussing mergers and acquisitions. When Kate was thrown into the cutthroat world of the Metropolitan Society pages, she experienced the links couples go to to have their announcements accepted and the links the writers go to to fact check their stories. The surprising status signaling details that matter most to brides and grooms and the politics of a paper at a time of vast cultural and industrial change. Reporting weekly on couples whose relationships seem inevitable or enviable or eye roll worthy and dealing with waspy grandparents and last minute snafus, Kate is surrounded by love or what we're told to believe is love. Kate Bullock said about mergers and acquisitions, anyone who enjoys ogling the love lives of couples featured in the newspaper won't be able to put this entertaining behind the scenes expo day down. And on that shining note of praise, I'll turn things over to our authors. Kate, Jenny, thank you so much for being here tonight. The virtual stage is yours. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited about this book in part because <laughs> <laughs> it, it finally exists it's been um, I I think 10 years since we first started talking about it and I was wondering 15. like is it 15 it's really really long time so like yeah. walk us through the journey like how does a book go from an I an I or how did this book go from being an idea to finally like getting it I felt it was very backloaded like there was like there was like <laughs> nothing for a long time and then suddenly like here's my proposal and the book is being written and announced out and we blurb it <laughs> and like we can do this Harvard bookstore um so yeah now that that what is what is the process and like you know fiction nonfiction. I mean there was there were this you know the idea behind this I felt like went through a lot of iterations it did it did. Um, and you, you have an idea of that better than most, I think. So I think you and I started talking about this book, on, honestly, I, just the idea of writing about wedding announcements, reporting on wedding announcements as a young person at the New York Times, as a young woman at the New York Times, especially like, you know, we were there through the recession when people were losing their jobs and their health insurance, you know, all of that. Like, we talked about that years and years ago, it feels like at this point. And um, I mean, I think at first I thought, oh, this would be a great fiction thing or something like in a Romana clay sort of like um Devil Wars Prada something like that like I think that was the initial idea a gazillion years ago 
Um, and I think you and I even sort of workshops some like, Oh yeah. I still, still, like, no, I still have your, the, you know, it's early days of Google docs. <laughs> I probably <laughs> never ever see the light of day you know it was uh, I remember we have all of the subway you know whatever stuff oh yeah <laughs> oh that's right that's yeah. right that's right so but you know I my husband and I um took buyouts from the times about four or five years ago we had a kid we moved back south to be close to family blah 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 and I happened to fall in with a group of awesome women writers around here who all had the same agent and they all had published books or were in, in the process of publishing books and so when they hooked me up with this agent, Jillian McKenzie, who's awesome, she and I sort of talked through what this really could be at this point in my life. And it made sense. It, it was almost inevitable that it was going to be a memoir because, I mean, as you remember, when I was writing these wedding announcements, I was also at that same point, like, sloughing off the effects of a long, fraught relationship with this guy. Oh, I remember. Good. I remember. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> I remember. Um, and, and, and also, like, you know, moving on from that and also like meeting and dating the man who would eventually become my husband. Um, so, and, and to me, those two experiences, those several experiences, along with like coming of age in New York as a young woman, all, all that stuff feel incredibly intertwined. You know, they're, they're just vines wrapping around each other. So that's what happened. That's how it became a memoir. And also I'm not a sociologist. Like I am not going to like write some like sociological text about like the meaning of marriage and not Stephanie Kuntz, you know, she is um, smarter than I am. So here we are. So now we have a memoir. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, you know, when we went through the fiction thing it was so long ago and it was about being like young in twenties and like, you know, mm -hmm. a writer in New York city. And I remember when girls came out as a television show, yeah. um, I was like, mm -hmm. oh, she's, you know, <laughs> Lena Dunham that, has done it. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh. We missed that boat, <laughs> but, but there, were, but there is like, I mean, not a lot of this didn't make it into the book, but there were so many aspects of life back, back then in the, the early aughts or whatever, like, you know, going to Planned Parenthood and getting your birth control or cause like no one had health insurance and like, or I'm dealing with like I'm all of that not, stuff, yeah. you know? So that's very much part of like the way I lived and like the way you lived to a certain extent. And, um, you know, but I think we felt like girls get captured a lot of that too. <laughs> so instead we have a memoir <laughs> and I. Um, but from my from what I understand this also may arrive maybe on a screen in some time in the nearish maybe not near future but it's on its way to the screen and I was wondering if you could what you're allowed to say if anything about that i don't i don't know that i'm actually allowed oh, okay to say. well that is fine so one day this may this is, is it, i would say it, something like this is very charming obviously for the screen and it may actually end up on the screen <laughs> I, it would be it would be wonderful it would be wonderful if that were in fact the case um i mean i did write this to be uh I, everybody who kind of grows mm -hmm. up not grows up in new york but like spends a certain amount of time in in new york i think feels like they have these cinematic points in their lives, mm -hmm. you know, because you can't help it. I mean, you grew up there and I think your life is very cinematic personally, <laughs> but, um, anyway, uh, but you know, like uh, in our, our first kiss was on the steps of the New York public library. And, you know, uh, we like, you know, spent birthdays, like riding helicopters around the Harbor. I mean, all of that stuff sort of, it feels cinematic because we've already seen it all on screen maybe not in this way and then I only so. learned after the fact in reading your your uh, word doc that I was there earlier in the night right I think it's the same night where you had your oh yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah same night. yeah 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 so <laughs> for the people watching this <laughs> who have not read the book Jenny is a major character in the book because um there used to be a Howard Johnson's in Times Square and it disappeared probably what 10 years ago at this point mm -hmm. but it was a great place to go get ice cream. And on the night that my now husband and I kissed for the first time, um, we hung out with Hojo's with you and- Someone random. I didn't even some know. Some dude, I don't know who it was. It um, All right, yeah, I, I don't know. know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like that person was like falling away. Like, yeah. I remember Hojo's, I remember you. <laughs> some friend, and but like we're sitting on these old Naga Hyde booths, you know, and and Michael and I were sitting on one side and our hands are down on the bench and he like reached over and, and started holding my hand under the table. 
and it was so hot that night. I know, you know, I know. Mm-hmm. it was so hot. And I just remember being like, oh, oh, <laughs> oh this, is, this is happening now. And then like, I remember I had this like pink short sleeve cashmere sweater on. What a stupid idea, a short sleeve cashmere sweater. Anyway, and I had this thing on and the smallest jean size I've ever worn in my life um, or in my adult life. And I remember after we left you guys, we wandered over to the library in Bryant Park. And we sat there and we kissed until five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I got home and my mouth was all swollen. But <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. And I learned a lot both from you and then from the book about the craziness of the wedding announcements in the New York Times, like the fact checking. Um, I think that was really what struck me. And I was wondering, uh, yeah, the sort of like the, the <laughs> tense fact checking, and I'm 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 just sort of like intensely curious that people try to lie in some of lie, the, yeah. So like yeah, they some lie. of the craziness, you know, like mm-hmm. you know, whatever greatest hits of the craziness. I remember, I think, um, was it like Broadway tickets or theater tickets? And I know some of the details are uh, both the people and everything have to be a little bit like. Fast mm-hmm. that's out because of um, yeah. the, fact of the memoir and there's a legal department and all that, but <laughs> but you know like what sh- surprised you about like the craziness of being drafted? You know, oh my god! Wedding. I mean, I-, I grew up in like suburban North Carolina where I currently reside, and I did not realize the um, weight that these wedding announcements carried until I started working on them and how important they were to some people at a very specific point in their lives. You know, like I grew up, like I have my mother's wedding announcement here somewhere, but it's something that was submitted, you know, it, or, or like, it was yeah. like, it, it wasn't, it wasn't fact checked and it had things like, you know, the color of the roses on her bouquet and like where they would be visiting on their, where they would be going on their honeymoon and where they would be living when they got back, like that kind of stuff. Right. But, and that's not fact checked. That's just, submitted and it is what it is but these wedding announcements for a select group of people or 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 like a a certain echelon of society they were hugely important I mean not not only do they like signify lineage and stature in society for some people like they almost are like an informal part of a resume like you, you talk to these dudes at like Goldman Sachs right and they were so intent on making sure that their title was exactly correct or even maybe a little bit elevated which is not what we should do because like the guys in the cubicles next to them would be reading them, you know, and it was like one more signal or signifier that like these people were on their way or like these people belonged. I mean, it was all about belonging, right? And so when you would fact check these things, people lied. And that was the best way to not get your announcement in the times is to lie, right? Because the guy behind the character of Ira, that was like the biggest strike. I mean, and then people lied about like, or they would blow aviate or, or um, they would blow smoke about their titles. A lot of it was about titles, which seems so stupid, but like associate vice president versus vice president, that sort of thing. Or like they would lie about whether they were descended from a Mayflower, somebody who signed the Mayflower Compact, which like- Can you actually check that? That one's actually interesting. I mean, you can check a title, you can check graduation, you know, with the, right. how do you check lineage? Um, well, you have to be, according to, the um, society desk, which I don't think it's called the society desk anymore, the wedding, weddings desk, whatever it is. Um, at that point, when I was doing it, you had, it was very weird. You had to have uh, proven your lineage to the Mayflower Society. Like you had to be, which is through like family Bibles and tax records and all, right. on all sorts of things. Like, like I am a descendant of um, somebody who came over on the Mayflower and we have like text records and Bibles and family, re- like the records that people keep that would exist at like the Southern Historical Records Collection or something like that, or like the Mormons would use <laughs> to prove lineage. So, but people would have to like, most often you would say, well, like you have to either be a member of the Mayflower Society proper or all of the people who are all of the, I can't believe I know this, the original passengers on the Mayflower, all of them have their own society. Like Edward Doty, the guy, the horrible human being who I am descended from has his own society. And it's called <laughs> Edward Doty Society. So that's how you, that's how we would fact check that. But like for titles, you'd call the HR departments for um, 
you know, for honors, like you would, you would call Harvard and, or like, or you would get, like, if you got married, they would require you to fax over a copy of your transcript to prove that you graduated like magna uh, or summa yeah. or whatever. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> or if one, if one <laughs> with highest honors. I know. I don't even I, know where my diploma is. I feel like I gave it to my parents. I'm like, there's like, you know, 200,000. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I know. I know. I mean, I took like, I took a, I mean, this was the days before I thought, no, it wasn't the day before. I took like a, a very blurry digital phone picture of my diploma and emailed it to iRed. Yeah, yeah way like, before iPhones. Right? Oh yeah. You in 03 and iPhones 07. Um, yeah. Which was, um, and then like, I know you like me got pinged by friends occasionally if, or very, oh. <laughs> to like mm -hmm. see if you could help get their wedding announcement into the um, section. And mm -hmm. what was that like? I mean, you were on the front lines of it. I only occasionally had like classmates like kind of poke me, mm -hmm. <sighs> but yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, I learned very quickly. And like, I actually, I started doing this in DC when we first, when we worked there, I started, I learned very quickly not to tell people where I worked for, where I worked because for okay. you it was different. Like you were already a reporter, right? right? And so like you wanted the stories. Like I was a clerk in DC and I was like, I, I just, all I do is answer the phones and like sign <laughs> some packages. Like I, I you know. <laughs> Uh, so, and so when I got to New York, like I learned very quickly not to say what I did, um, because it was this immediate, like, you know, it's currency. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was very weird. And I, I, I remember one of my second cousin's friends from Nashville who lived in New York, he was a broker at whatever he called me we had met at brunch or something and he called me and he said he and his really lovely wife were getting married or girlfriend were getting married and he wanted to get his wedding announcement and I said well send me your stuff whatever I'll see what I can do because he was a nice person I didn't want to immediately be like no I can't do that and he started they did sort of fit the bill like he went to Vanderbilt he was a broker she was in PR you know like they were they were this sort of like classic couple but there <laughs> he included all of this stuff about his parents hunt club in Nashville, like literally like a hunting club. And that was the sort of stuff that he was like, why can't you put it in? And I was like, because we don't. And that's, <laughs> and that's weird. <laughs> like, we don't do that. And it became the sort of, it was a very tense situation because Ira, the person behind the character of Ira would never have included information about like what country clubs his parents belonged to or right. their hunt clubs or whatever. And, but to him, and the, the part of society he was from, that was a really big deal. It was like yet another signifier <clears throat> or whatever. But anyway, yes, I hated those conversations. They made it, they felt really icky. I didn't like them. Oh no, yeah. I, I would get yeah. like people like people you hadn't heard from from like for like 10 years, kind of like oh, you know, oh yeah. For their sister. Yeah. Um uh -huh. so one, and, one question. I'm uh -huh. oh, sorry, okay. go ahead. Well, the emails already started with like hey how's it going like, <laughs> long time no see, see you're not I know. hope you're well <laughs> by the way um yeah <laughs> military rank how did you fact check military awards and ranks and then did you ever have to like fact check like knighthood or like lordship or anything like that I never had to fact check <laughs> lordship <laughs> I personally never had to see that I know that Ira did. <laughs> he did. That's right. Military rank. That's a really good question. I honestly don't remember how we did that because, like, uh, I guess mil military HR files are like not accessible to the general public. That's a really good question. I don't remember how we did that. I mean, to be perfectly honest, like, I don't remember having very many yeah. military people. Um, and I think, if I remember correctly, I mean, this is the cloud of time, but I think we kind of maybe took that on their word because we were like, well, military people don't lie, I think. I know, I and know. now now is like the, all the, know. what is it, the false valor? What is it? Um, and now we know, mm -hmm. now we know better. <laughs> or also, yeah. I think that time it was <laughs> a little bit earlier enough that you didn't have the same waves of people who had gone through yes. major tours of duty. So I think that generation, yeah. you're still, whereas now, you know, um, yeah, lots of people 
both having been vets you know, in Congress and also like flying about it. Um, so then one thing that I've always was a little bit like eh, about, and you, you kind of bring it up indirectly in your book and also affected one of our uh, colleagues at the times, which is from an SEO perspective from Google, the fact that your full name is in the headline of an article in the New York Times means that it often is the highest ranking thing for you mm -hmm. or one of the highest ranking, even when you're divorced. <laughs> and so <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you remember this, but one of our <laughs> colleagues got married to someone she met after 9-11 and then they got divorced very quickly. But that like article was still like the top hit for a really I long time. I don't remember this. Yeah, yeah. I don't know I... that you would know that. Well, I got, but 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 this is this is relevant to you because you you have a spectacular like oh like, my god. Made, like I couldn't even believe this was true. But yeah, I mean, can you tell the most heartbreaking um Yeah, 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 yeah. Ask, text me after and tell me who that person is because I don't I have no recollection of this but okay I, I don't think you wouldn't you would know I just happen I would happen to know I will text you who it is I actually can even text you right now actually okay <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes okay so the end of the book uh the, the one of the last chapters in the book is um uh I this woman called me from where she had been spending her honeymoon or where she got married and where they were going to the honeymoon. She called me on Monday morning and she asked if she could have her wedding announcement taken down from the Times site. And I said, no. And then of course I punted the question to the society editor because like, you know, and the, re and there, the reason she wanted her announcement to be taken down is because she had found out on the weekend she got married that her husband had been sleeping with a bridesmaid the entire time or I, you know, I don't know if the ent their entire relationship but like long enough long enough you know and so <laughs> um and this woman who she was a like a junior associate or an associate at a white shoe law firm like she was on the rise and she knew just like many of her colleagues who were also been in the times like that was going to be the first thing that came up about her when anybody Googled her for any particular reason, you know, for professional reasons, personal reasons, whatever. And, but as you know, the Times treats wedding announcements as news articles and they don't take news articles down. I mean, they'll, they'll slap the biggest honking editor's note you've ever seen on a news article, but they don't take it down because a wedding announcement is a reportage of a wedding. Right. Like it's personal to these people, but to the Times, it's reportage of an event that happened. And so they're not going to take that down. And I remember getting really pissed or like really kind of angry on behalf of this woman because I was like, what? <laughs> and she went into, she kind of went into detail about like how she, now all the details of the book in the book are changed, of course, like how this actually went down. But, um, but the crux of the matter is, completely true like this after this 100 happened and um it's still up it's up i mean like they got the you know they got an old or whatever and and she's remarried and, and all of that but yeah i mean up until this book the first thing that you, that came up about me obviously was my wedding announcement and had i never written this book like that would probably be the first the first thing that always came up about me but my full name my full name is not in the um in the in the headline it's just my my kate is my nickname it's not mary catherine which is good <laughs> and a fun wedding <laughs> and a, <laughs> a fun wedding it was it was a fun wedding we had. and kind of interesting so, so i mean we were just talking about this before um in mm -hmm. terms of weddings and appropriateness and <laughs> well dated i mean you can go into that or i can go into it okay <laughs> but, no go, yeah. go for it no go i'm kind of <clears throat> so you got married on a plantation mm -hmm. <clears throat> and as you know um you know times have changed and i actually respect a lot of um the dating website uh sorry the the wedding websites for for no longer listing plantations mm -hmm. among wedding venues mm -hmm. um for you know many different reasons, and I was just kind of wondering, like, if you look look back at the wedding. Like, first of all, tell us about the wedding, like where it was held, why it was held there. Um, okay. And then looking back, having had a plantation, a wedding, what does it feel like in the year twenty twenty one? Oh know, my god! Yeah. Uh, well, 
so we got married in April 2010. Um, and my parents at that point were living in the Shenandoah Valley. And we just, we were living in New York and we decided for logistical reasons among, and cost reasons, among other reasons, we would get married down there. And they, they live, um, at, they lived at that point near Charlottesville where there's Monticello, all these historical houses, right? And next to Monticello is a place called Ashlawn Highland, which is um, where, oh God. I think it's Madi- Jan- uh, Monroe. James Monroe. James yeah, Monroe. Yeah. It, was yeah, like another, it was like a second tier president. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> that was like his country home or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was, it, it was and is still owned by the College of William and Mary. And we got married there because it, I mean, honestly, frankly, it was affordable. Um, <clears throat> It was a beautiful, it remains a beautiful spot. Yeah, and there are peacocks wandering around. So like, why would you not get married? And I do remember you had to walk through the gift shop to get to where <laughs> we got married. That was, it was, that was a little odd. It felt a little bit, I don't know, peepy. But um, it, wasn't lo- it wasn't long after that when I started thinking about, I mean, even at that point, even like on our wedding day, like we have pictures of ourselves taken in front of refurbished slave quarters right Mm -hmm. and you know you can say oh educational purpose is all you want but the fact of the matter was like this was for many years a working plantation and um the college the William and Mary is having to reckon with this I think there was a story in the times a couple years ago about how um student groups in William and Mary were like hey guys guess (laughs) what they used to do you know (laughs) and and they look at it as obviously it's a very complicated thing for them because they, they love having this historical piece of property and they use it for research purposes but also yes it was a working plantation for many years and there's a lot of evidence that points to the fact that James the president James James Monroe which he was the third fourth fifth thank you fifth okay he's <laughs> uh, very good at the order of presidents by the way Sewell Chan our our friend who's now LA Times editorial page editor we played a game which is like can you name the president in order like I could have done it in third grade and I I, I, I couldn't do it, but I can go up to like Monroe <laughs> and there's like a bunch that I can do <laughs> kind of around like Lincoln you know and then like you know and then there's a whole Cleveland you know Grover Cleveland had two that were separated uh, but anyway yeah, Monroe yeah, was number yeah. five <laughs> that, <laughs> that is not even remotely surprising me that Sewell could just like reel them off um <laughs> Anyway, I'll see well. uh, Anyway, <laughs> he was here in Bozeman with me. Do you know? Bo- he came up to Bozeman. It was his first visit to. Um, I wonder why he was in Montana. Yeah, because I'm here. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Because I thought, I'd, okay, this is completely <laughs> off topic. But yeah, I saw you've been posting on Instagram. Oh, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Just, Give him a big hug for me if you see him. I love Sewell. Um, he's like the loveliest. But anyway, okay. So back to the point. Um, so yes, it was not long after that that we, uh, I certainly started thinking maybe that wasn't the right thing to do maybe <laughs> or like maybe we should have looked at it through a different oh shit maybe we should have looked at it through a different lens for example but um you know we can't take it back uh so at this point i i, I have how would you explain it to your daughter then? Does that make sense at the point that she understands? Oh, totally. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we, we've talked about like, you know, we're very two upfront six, about the fact. By the way, Pardon, right? two or six. Yes, two or six. I mean, we've talked about the fact that like, and it's, it's hard for her to, to understand, like we talked about slavery and enslavement and all of that. And like, she knows that she is descended directly from people who enslaved others. Like she, she knows that. And we've had that conversation. I mean, I think one day we'll take her there and show her around the spot and say like we got married here and oh, <laughs> on the same grounds where the enslavement that we have talked to you about what's happening and like i think that we just have to talk about the complicated legacy that she holds in her in her dna um and i think we can also explain it as sometimes people don't make um, <laughs> the best choices which is which sounds flip and i don't mean it actually to sound flip but like um I hate the, the the whole idea of being a product of his time is complete bullshit. It's bullshit. <laughs> you know, I, I think that um, in some ways we should have known better. Um, but by the same token, like, I don't know what to do about it now other than to like not let her get married on a plantation. <laughs> if I have the control for that. I don't, I don't think, I don't know if I'm talking very coherently about this, but like, I don't, I, like I have deep regret about it, but by the same token, I'm not sure how to, 
reckon with it in a way that is helpful. And forward looking, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, you know, talking about it and you're right. Obviously, obviously there's already been sort of reckoning within the industry, but it's continued yeah. to reckon. Um, and actually what I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, share one of my most interesting kind of like, like kind of realizations um, mm -hmm. in the New York Times. So this is probably under house. So this might've been like 2003, 2004, I think when we were hanging out in Washington, which is they started doing gay wedding announcements. And what was so interesting was I remember the first one I had a photo and it said, you know, like whatever, I don't mean, it was like Mr. Jack Horner versus like, you know, Joe, whatever. And then they didn't mm -hmm. tell you which one was which in the oh, that's right. photo. Do you remember? Yes. Just, with with, with yes. the men and women, you, you can kind of basically intuitively tell from their names, like, and then right. um, it suddenly, it was just like this tiny moment for, for me to, that like, oh, we have to, there are little tiny mm -hmm. adjustments that have to be made because now that we mm -hmm. have gay wedding announcements, but it was also surprising to me that no one caught it. That like I was, you know, I think I even might have written into someone to be like, oh, by the way, if you don't say who is who, you we don't we don't know <laughs> because they're the same here. <laughs> I know. You have to say like left <laughs> and right, and then they started doing it. But do you rem <laughs> do you remember like like what was it like when the gay wedding announcement started rolling through? And so yes, okay, so that so the first one was when we were still in DC, and it was two thousand three. Yeah. And um and David Dunlap actually um, followed up with them years and years later because he wanted to know what happened. And they um so these two guys whose names escape me mm -hmm. could have gotten married in Canada, but they because I think that they lived on the or they had a summer house in Canada, something like that anyway, but they wanted to wait until they could get married in the United States. And um, or like their union would be recognized in the United States or something like that. But anyway, uh, they got married in Vermont. And yeah, no, I know, of course. Oh, and, yeah, everyone's like, Howard <laughs> Dean. Like, like, you remember, like, 04 presidential extreme. Uh, anyway. Were you in Iowa? Were you in Iowa for that too? Were we both in Iowa? No, where was mm -hmm. it? I was, was in, in I was, yeah, that was okay. New Hampshire, I think. No, I, that, that was in, that was, um, I was in Iowa in 07. Okay. I said, no, wait, um, with Obama. Um, but anyway, um, what were we talking about? Oh, gay weddings. Yes. So, and you know, one of the reasons why they didn't put announce gay announcements in the paper for such a long time. I mean, they said anyway. So, one of the main rules about wedding announcements, the times of wedding announcements, is that they have to be on around the time period that you get legally married. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the and like this, this has caught some of my friends. Yeah. Uh, in very weird ways. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and it, it can disappoint people because like, you know, they think, and most people think that the binding ceremony is the one where you stand up in front of your family and friends, whatever, but like to the society pages, the binding ceremony is the one in which is legally recorded with the state of New York or whatever. And so one of the things that they said, and remember this was a decision made like at the highest level, you know, like who, who was Powell, I think was the editor at the time, whoever it was, anyway, it went all the way up to, to our, to, um, Salzburgers. And, um, but because none of these weddings were legal, legally recognized in the United States, they, that uh, to me, that was in some way a way to say we, we can't make this decision, you know, because there's no legal standing for it, but like, whatever. Um, I mean, so I started writing them in 2004. And one of the first weeks I had, I didn't have that many same sex announcements, honestly. Um, the first season, because I think they had just opened it up and to same sex couples. And I think people were still sort of like, eh, uh, you know, not on the desk, but I think I'm guessing that the same sex couples were like, we've been excluded from these pages for, <laughs> for as long as they've existed. Why would we start now? But anyway, I do remember I had two women um, and uh, one of the women, her dad was, you remember Sandler O'Neill, the firm in, in oh, yeah, yeah. Towers, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like her dad was hit, hit very yes. Hard. Yeah. yes, hit very hard, hit very hard, like lost like hundreds of people. Her dad was O'Neill. And I remember they were getting married in their backyard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> their backyard of, you know, like their North Fork estate or whatever. But I remember, I can't remember if it was her or her, her spouse, but like 
they were towel, she was a towel salesperson at ABC Carpet and Home. And this was a very big deal. Like she was like the lead salesperson for this brand of these two brands of towels. And I was like, why? I mean, no offense, but like, why is this woman in the, like, why are these people in the time? Right. <laughs> but uh, like, not to be snobby, but like, you've got like this, this towel saleswoman next to like, I don't know, Harvard professors and like lawyers. And, but it was for two reasons. Number one, like she was part of a same sex couple that like had the chutzpah to um, send their announcements at the times. And they were awesome. They were really like, her wife was, um, I think she was a teacher for America or something like that. But also her dad was O'Neill, a fan of O'Neill. And do you remember, um, you may not remember this, her mom, the times that I think Corey Hoganan did the story about her mom made it a point to go to every single funeral of everybody that the firm lost. And there was a store, like he did a ride around, I think it was Corey, did a ride around with her um, all over Long Island. And she had just like stacks of vanilla folders with like the bios of these people that had been lost. And so it was like this, it was like this New York lineage thing in a way. But anyway, um, I mean, I definitely had more same sex couples than I had couples of color. Yes. <laughs> right. I, yeah, I remember. And I remember, actually, I remember telling people they had like, a, if they were diverse, <laughs> that they had a like submit, like they have a, and especially like certain times of year. Oh, this is the other thing I remember. Certain times of year it was easier to get your wedding announcement into the, into the. Oh yeah. Cause there are fewer yeah, people. When, yeah, yeah. Yeah. When, when, but it's also like, it's not just fewer people, right? Cause it's, they do actually expand, right? It's about the like supply and demand kind of. Mm -hmm. match. Yeah. Which, so just from your experience, when was it, if you, if one really aimed to get their wedding announcement at times, statistically, what are the months or times of year that are best? October. October. Okay. October. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I actually, no, 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 it's not true. No, it used to be late August because like nobody wanted to get married in like the really hottest summer months, yeah. right? Like August was like, eh, you, you know, you want to go to the beach. You don't want to like go to somebody's wedding unless they were getting married in like Maine or Vermont. It's cool right there. So um, late August, things tended to die down a little bit. And then like after Labor Day and like the cooler temperatures were coming in, they'd have these beautiful fall weddings. But I would say like, after um after like mid-October that was like when you started getting towards like through the Jewish holidays and like Thanksgiving and all that that was when you <laughs> better shot <laughs> of getting in or you know like I don't know deep February yeah, yeah I was like February <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but April um, May June July like even July now like you know, you better get it in early and you better have a really good submission or, yeah. <laughs> and oftentimes who's doing the submitting? Was it the brides and grooms themselves or their parents? Or often, often it was like the mother or the, the right. mother of the bride or the mother of the groom or the mother of one of the people getting married for sure. Like it was, it was very often, it was, um, you would have a, almost have a hard time getting, especially the grooms on the phone. Cause they would be like, Oh God my mother wants me to do this. Um, but often, you know, well, like occasionally, like you get these people who were descended from these society families and they just didn't care at all. But it was like their grandmother who wanted, like, I still have a note somewhere. I probably can't, I shan't, can't show it on camera. But anyway, I have a note from a woman who wrote this like, and her, she has like very crabbed hand on engraved stationery of her Fifth Avenue address. Actually, it had her, you know, her address in Fifth Avenue, but then she'd written her Newport address above it. <laughs> and she had sent the note, her Newport, Rhode Island um, address, and she had sent the note to Bill Cunningham asking him to make sure that her granddaughter's announcement was in the Times. And her granddaughter was a kindergarten teacher. Her granddaughter didn't, didn't give a shit. But this woman who was like this huge socialite, like she was, she had married into the Astors, like she was a very big deal in yeah. old school New York society. Like it was really, really important to her that her granddaughter, you know, making $26,000 a year <laughs> as a kindergarten teacher. It, again, like it, it, obviously salary has nothing to do with it, but like in the world of these wedding announcements, like economic status clearly is a huge factor. So anyway, yeah, I have it somewhere though. Um, and I mean, just from 
so, so one little thing was um, I, I will mention is um, Kate sent me the draft and then I recognized myself and I was like, I want my real name in it. I was like, you can right. <laughs> I want to, I want to be known that it's me. You're like the only in, person. In I know there. I'm the only person in only it. And I, I anyway. wanted, yeah. She's like, I'm kind of curious when you, and I've always been curious about this because I write straight up nonfiction. I don't do like kind of the memory thing. Um, yeah. What do you do? Like, how do you maneuver? Like, do you tell like one, what do you do about the names? And then, then like the identifying details. And then do you tell mm -hmm. people like in who are like kind of more ambiently around? I mean, obviously your husband knew um, some mm -hmm. other people. There are definitely people like, you know, the, the tempestuous relationship that you had for a long time. Did you tell him mm -hmm. that this book was coming out or is it like, surprise? <laughs> like, anyway. Well, uh, that's a really good <laughs> question. No, I told him. Um, and I, you know, I, we're still in contact with each other. I mean, we we're still in the basic, we're in the same geography, actually. Oh, um, oh mm -hmm. actually, maybe I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Just, just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I told him after I had submitted the second test pages, which is part of the publishing process, you know, like final edits. And I, I just needed that space to, so yes, I emailed him and he actually said that he had seen it. Somebody had posted about it on LinkedIn or like I hadn't, but he'd seen, he sort of had an inkling about it. And he said, and then I thought, oh, hey, I might be a part of this book. And I was like, yep, well, well yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. Um, <laughs> I mean, only for the first couple of chapters, but yes. Yeah. Um, and he, because he was, you know, he's a hugely important part of my I early remember, life. I, I mean, like you knew him, you knew him pretty, yeah. pretty well. Um, and so one thing that he, and I still have, have a continuing dialogue about is, um, it came very occasionally, is um, about how it was really important to me to protect him as a person, not just because, not just for legal reasons, um, but because I still care about him, you know, and like I care about his privacy and I don't want it, uh, I don't want anybody in our community now to recognize him who wouldn't have, rec who didn't know him 20 years ago, you know, I feel like that's really important. Um, but one of the things that um, the legal team had me change was his ethnicity. Oh, I did notice that. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. And that was a, that I think for, for many clear reasons bothered him. I mean, as it would, uh, yes, for, yes, it bothered him immensely. And so we still talk about it, you know, and, and he asked me a question one day, not too long ago about like, well, how often does this happen to white people? And I was like, that's a really good question. I don't know. I don't know. And like, to a certain extent, it's probably a numbers game to a certain extent. Like he, um, his, he's, um, he is known. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. yeah. After, you know, <laughs> it was, um, <laughs> also it was like, I, like maybe within the last year, this mysterious person emailed me about <laughs> unrelated asking me to be <laughs> as part of this other meeting and I was like I know this name and I was like thinking like like how do I know this name yeah. and then I was like oh my god <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah guy. and yeah. then I like Google and I was like oh he's done a lot of interesting things and it's like you know I yes all. he has <laughs> yeah I know I have to I have to move this over because my phone is dying I'm sorry to say this is very wildly unprofessional of me but um yes he has done a lot of interesting stuff and he has is gaining um I wouldn't say notoriety but fame in his own right for his own awesome really cool work and so uh, he but he still has a reasonable I mean in terms of like the expectation of privacy he really still has a pretty high expectation of privacy like so the the, <clears throat> the anecdote at the beginning of the book the like senior senator of the great state of New York like he has no expectation of privacy right and like every single thing I wrote about him, except for um, the conversations that we had, had been already had already been reported in like page six or the post or the times. Like, you know, James Barron covered the press conference that he held when he announced like his new relationship. I mean, honestly, right. um, hold on, I need to get my phone cord. But so, um, yeah, it's all very okay. Sorry, this is super unprofessional of me. Sorry, you can also see my very messy office. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so, but how, it, okay, so I changed all the identifying details of people who um, have 
expectations of privacy, right? Like the character of Rebecca in the book, she's my my old roommate. Um, we're still very good friends. And I told her in advance like, what was gonna be in the book and she thought it was all great and fine and hilarious, it's fine. Um, in terms of the couples themselves, um, mo all of the couples with the exception of maybe like one or two, I think have, um, have made up names like clever names you know mm -hmm. um and I did that because you know when you're when you talk to these people for their wedding announcements they weren't talking to me because they were going to be in my memoir 15 years later they were talking to me because they wanted their wedding announcement to paper mm -hmm. and most of these people with the exception of like Cheryl Sandberg for example mm -hmm. um have a very high expectation in the private you know they're like <laughs> they, have, <laughs> they they their, their cases would hold up in court is what I'm trying to say so that's one reason why I changed them. And also like, well, I mean, that's the main reason I don't want to get sued. <laughs> I don't want to get sued. And, and they, they, um, they are private individuals and they should remain private individuals. And so. what, is, what does the publishing house do to make it like, to make that happen? If that makes sense. Oh, uh, well, in this day and age, you sit on Zoom for hours and hours and hours with the legal team from penguin random house and they have gone through the manuscript and highlighted or flagged every single thing that they think would provide any sort of potential legal exposure and you just tweak it and i will say like as a journalist like it felt really weird Doesn't to change feel, this stuff yeah it feels icky it feels very icky and weird but like you what that felt like actually and, and yes yeah, you know, one of the yeah. small moments is i was reading this and i was like wait, was that my roommate in DC? Because <laughs> I was like, oh my God, did she got yeah. tweet. I think she went out on a date. With my One, date. One date. One date. One date. One date. One date. The, the book explains why. Uh, <laughs> I had a lot, of, I had a lot of one dates in DC. Um, I have, I've had so many friends read this book and then like text me while they're reading it because they remember this stuff, like yeah. the guy whose head was shaped like a penis, you know, like a friend of mine, oh, is this over on me? Oh, um, like, um, or like the incident with my father-in-law and his underpants, you know, like many people have heard that story or um, the wedding where like my dress fell and like my boobs were at, you know, all of that stuff. Like people were texting me like, I remember that. But <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Um, and, and something that's interesting from my perspective, also journalism, how did you remember enough of your life to write a memoir? I mean, is this based on diaries or it's kind of like recreated or like you just have a much more <laughs> like, and I think we've talked about I, you have a much more um, like intricate memory about life than I, I, I would not be able to do anything near the detail of what you did. I um I remember a lot of this like I just do like I can't remember the fifth president of the United States <laughs> but like I remember that I was wearing a pink short sleeve cashmere sweater from the limited by the way from the limited <laughs> um when Michael and I first kissed um but you know also like I have you know that's the great thing about the internet like I have a whole after a certain point like I have G chat you know, all the, like so much of the stuff ended up in Gchat or like emails back and forth to people AOL, or AOL Instant Messenger, RIP. Oh, oh I know. I got it. Oh my I God, I heard all you of that. So I know. <laughs> I, you had such a funny username now that I think about it. Oh, it was it? It was that a little sprout. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know why. <laughs> I don't remember why, but, but, but if I, if I had all that stuff, and I rem like, I remember, cause that was, yes, that was when we were always on, I am our aim all the time. Right. Yeah. And I had this friend who, um, she had these, her sex life was very active and she would always send me aim messages and they would be flashing on my laptop or my computer when I got back to my desk from lunch or whatever. <laughs> And there would be things like the condom broke or whatever. And it's just like sitting there, you know. In the washing bureau. <laughs> yeah, no, or like it like next to Ira's desk. Like oh. I sat right next to him and he would be like. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so but I mean, in terms of the wedding announcements, like I have stacks of notes. I, I have my notes from from a oh. lot of that. Um, and I have like a lot of the actual submissions that people I should it's not supposed to take, but I took them anyway. 
but in terms of like my memories, like I just have a memory. You like, I, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just do. I know. Like, nothing as coherent. And then, two, <laughs> like, I just would not be able, I just wouldn't be able to like recreate some of these things. Like, you know, I can, I can tell you the, you know, the, the, the capitals of the state you know, state governments, but like would not mm -hmm. be able to tell you like what I was wearing, even like on some of the, like my brother's wedding or something. Um, so one question. I remember what you were wearing at my wedding, actually. Oh, what, what was I, what, I have no idea. What was I wearing? <laughs> well, you well, also it, well <laughs> I, know? I do. I wish I had, I, I wish I should have dug out a photo of you actually at my <laughs> wedding. That you had this like red velvet cap on um, and you had, you wore your coat for the most of it because it was kind of chilly, but you had it was yes it was like a white coat with a belt and it was like a double breasted yeah 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 oh wow yeah yeah, yeah. No, I, I went through this whole great and then I, lo I lost yeah. that white coat on a I left it on a ship in the closet by the way. and then uh. I was like yeah I was sad I was I really like <laughs> um so in your contemplation of life and marriage mm -hmm. and like everything mm -hmm. do you think this is a question actually from the audience um do you think the wedding industry what it presents actually is very highly correlated with what makes for a successful marriage in the long run and you guys oh, have been God, like 10 years 10 years 11, 11, 11 years oh my God, yeah. well, 11 years 11. last month yeah 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 11 years um you know it's a good question and i think about that a lot especially now that people are having much smaller more intimate weddings or like youtube weddings you know, virtual yeah. weddings it's like we can't you know i think a lot of people don't feel quite comfortable gathering yet um well i mean i think the thing that the weddings industry pushes is happily ever after and happily ever, happily ever after is like a complete crock of shit right and i can say that in feeling I, I feel completely comfortable saying that um having been married for 11 years and being completely and totally in love with my husband and so grateful that i married him but also knowing that like happily ever after and the like writing off of the sunset is is garbage and no one should ever believe it. So um and it sounds like I'm being cynical, but I'm I, I'm not. I mean, we've been married a lot. We've been you know, we've been together like 17 years. And um Yeah, two thousand four. Mm-hmm. Yep. July? And it was hot. Whenever when what what month was that first kiss? September. 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 Okay, it was hot. Mm -hmm. It was. It was hot and it was kind of rainy. It's kind of gross and like pink cashmere shirt sleeve sweater um but anyway i mean we've been together almost two decades at this point and we've seen i know and we've seen all sorts of stuff you know losses and you know job losses miscarriage you know the death of family members uh, the enormous stresses like you know, donald trump's presidency like all you know all of this oh. stuff and <laughs> uh, hey, Tina, i remember actually one of your most romantic journeys together is driving didn't you drive oh like, katrina together yes Hurricane yes katrina? Okay. yes yes oh yes we had to drive an rv from new jersey to new orleans yes for that um, but anyway, so I, you know, I don't think any of that stuff qualifies as happily ever after, but I think maybe the definition of happily ever after needs to change, right. um, obviously. But in terms of like the weddings industry, the, yeah, I think the, the, the messages they push are just so outdated, you know? I, like, did you see the story? You would have been all over the story had you been a reporter. The story about um, marriages between friends. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. I, I yeah. Good. yeah that um it was a great story and i you know the nature of marriage itself is changing very slowly right it's like um, who do you want to co-parent with and have an economic like exactly climate with <laughs> Ab yeah ab absolutely it's a different absolutely. way from like who you want to sleep with and like yeah, know, yeah. Right, right like like who are you cool waking up next to for the rest of your life versus like no actually who are these who is the person you want to do all of these things with mm -hmm. and it might not be the same person yeah. So, you know, I think the weddings industry is going to have to start pushing a different message if there is a unified message other than happily ever after and pinch charming and yeah. all that stuff. And what was the most memorable or wildest wedding that you've ever been to, either as a guest or as, um, as you know, in the capacity of being a wedding reporter for the mm -hmm. question? Um, let me think. Okay, so the wedding, there's a wedding in the um that I did not write about, and it was the it was two people, it was a vows column I did. 
and it was these two people who got married um, on the last day of the gates. Remember the gates? Oh yes, we do yeah. remember the gates. Yeah, they got, it was freezing. It was like late January and they got married. Um, this is not a wild wedding. It was just sort of like a quintessential white people vows wedding in some ways. Yeah. Um, so they decided to get married for the last day of the gates and the, um, they commandeered like one of, uh, one of the arches under like the, the tunnels in Central Park. And these two like very white people hung Tibetan prayer flags. <laughs> um <laughs> I used to say I was I'm in Montana and I just saw Tibetan prayer flags in the backyard of some very white people. Yeah. Yes. By the way, Montana, 0.6% yes. black, 0.9% Asian, just to give you a sense of Montana. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad you made I mean, your <laughs> yeah. you know, our, our group of friends here is like four people of color. Like we definitely like moved the needle for both. You've family. contributed to integrating <laughs> Montana. <Yeah>. So. <laughs> Well, you. Um, but anyway, so they they hung Tibetan Tibetan fur flags. But the funniest thing about this was that the woman, uh, woman in the marriage, the wedding, um, she had previously only dated women before this. She um, and then she met this guy, and they fell madly in love, and you know whatever. And Ira had the hardest time figuring out how to write like she was a lesbian, and then she. <laughs> <laughs> because like this was seriously this was at the during the time when like we just didn't say that and this is not that long ago right but there was this like well we can't say she's a lesbian because she married a man and we were like well yeah but you know like <laughs> but that but that's not that's not a wild wedding that's just like a bizarre story I mean I have to say like my cousin's wedding in Alabama and to the, right after we got married that was a half million dollar wedding oh my god and it was 500 people white tie um the as far as I can tell the only people of color at that wedding were the wait staff yep <laughs> <In Alabama>. um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the group and I, I love my cousin dearly I should say this I do but um the groom's cake she and her, and her husband are big hunters and the groom's cake was this like massive three-tiered chocolate thing <laughs> And it was like a duck hunting scene mm -hmm. and it had like shotgun shells like on the cake, oh, yeah, like yeah. actual, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like <laughs> fondant dead ducks, like, like this, <laughs> like. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just discuss your family. <laughs> I know. And, and that's not even a wild thing either. That was, but it's just one of those things that has always stuck on my head is like cultural differences. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Good. I think. Wait. Are we supposed to? Be, it's on the hour, right? We're supposed to finish. Yes. There she's back. Okay. Yay. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> I was like, did I do this right? <laughs> That's how much it's blocked out on my calendar. <laughs> Ta -da. I love it. I love it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm still just like stuck on the idea of like bullets on a wet like a wedding oh, cake i'm i'm trying to be professional but i'm stuck on the idea of like fake fondant dead ducks anyway uh, hey jenny thank you for this really fun and fantastic talk it's really made my night it's been a real blast frankly um i'm really excited to read your book um oh, thank and you. yeah uh, for everyone who's here tonight and enjoying this fantastic talk with us check out the link in the chat um, if you want to support Kate and Harvard Bookstore, you can purchase your copy of Mergers and Acquisitions there. Yay. Please, please do that. Please remember to shop indie, shop local. Uh, thank you for watching. And again, Jenny, Kate, thank you for being here. Um, from all of us at Harvard Bookstore, have a great night and be well. Take care, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>